Your most precious possession, Christian, is for you to be in full union with Jesus Christ, knowing that he has reconciled you completely to God and he will never withdraw, he will never walk away, he will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The Lord's Prayer includes the command, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Forgiving those who have transgressed against us can be difficult, but with Christ in us, it is indeed possible. We'll consider the implications of God's forgiveness toward us today on The Truth Pulpit. Hi, I'm Bill Wright, and Pastor Don Green is taking us into the home stretch in our series, Philemon, Charge That to My Account. So far in the series, we've looked at the three main people in Philemon, Paul, Philemon himself, and his former slave, Onesimus. We've seen that each represents a part of the gospel and that in them, we can see types of God the Father, God the Son, and then us, sinners who deserve judgment but get unmerited grace instead. Today, we'll be picking up in Philemon 17. So if you would turn there in your Bible, and we'll join Don Green now in the Truth Pulpit. I want to begin in our time in God's Word by simply reading the text that is going to be the subject of my message. If you would turn to the book of Philemon, we are going to finish the book of Philemon today. And in the providence of God, once again, we've come to a text that has good things for us, as God's Word always does. Philemon, which is just before the book of Hebrews in your Bible, if you're not quite sure where to find that, Philemon, beginning in verse 17, the Apostle Paul wrote to his beloved friend, If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time also, prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message that says that that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, died for sinners and rose on the third day to give them life, to purchase for them the forgiveness of their sins. It is our blessed privilege as Christians, as a church, to be able to tell anyone who will hear that Christ will receive them and deliver them from sin if they come to Him in humble, repentant faith. This is a message that we can proclaim dogmatically to anyone, anywhere, at any time, anywhere in the world that this gospel message about Jesus Christ is for you. And if you will believe in Christ, you can have eternal life and be reconciled to God. That's a wonderful privilege. That's a wonderful trust to have deposited to you to be able to say those things. It's even more wonderful to be a partaker of the reality of which the gospel speaks. It is the most wonderful thing in life that you could ever have. It is your most precious possession, Christian, is for you to be in full union with Jesus Christ, knowing that He has reconciled you completely to God, and He will never withdraw, He will never walk away, He will be with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the most wonderful news. This is the most wonderful message anywhere in the universe. There will never be a better message than that. And one day when we're all gathered around the throne, we will simply sing the praises of the Lamb who was slain for us. There was an 
old theologian. I don't know if he was old at the time that he wrote it. He's old to us because this is back in the 19th century, who said, "'Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity.'" That is the message of the gospel, for you to abandon any sense of self-righteousness and to put your entire trust in Christ alone who lived a righteous, perfect life, died a perfect substitutionary death on your behalf, paid for your sins and was risen from the dead, God says, believe in my son and I'll forgive all of your sins forever and receive you into my family. That's a wonderful message, isn't it? It's okay to nod and acknowledge that. This is the best news of ever. The gospel is good news. Now, we're going to tie all of this into Philemon, believe it or not. One of the things that God does when He saves you is He gives you a new nature. You are born again. You are transformed. You are changed. And God gives you a nature that is like His own nature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And part of the aspect, one of the many blessed aspects of this new nature and this new disposition that God gives to you at conversion is this, is that He implants in His people a a forgiving spirit, a, a spirit that is willing to be forgiving just like God was forgiving to you. It's not simply a moral persuasion that says, oh, God forgave me and therefore I should forgive others. That's certainly very true. But God changes your nature, changes your heart in such a way that you are disposed in that direction if you're a true Christian. Jesus made this explicit in the Lord's Prayer. Genuine Christians, here's the thing before we turn over to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Genuine Christians are naturally inclined to forgive wrongs that are done against them. It is their bent. It is the direction of their lives. It is is the direction of a Christian to be like Christ in that forgiving nature rather than being hard and spiteful and irreconcilable. Jesus made this, as I said, explicit in the Lord's Prayer. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6 if you would. Matthew chapter 6, it even becomes a prerequisite to genuine prayer before God. Genuine prayer before God brings this forgiving spirit on its knees before God as it prays and makes its requests known. Let's start in Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. Jesus said, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, you go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus says, here's here's how you're to pray. Let me start in a preliminary matter, he says. I'll tell you that you're not to pray publicly in order to call attention to yourself. You go someplace where God doesn't see you praying, and you pray in a manner that only He sees. So it's a matter of private devotion before God rather than making a spiritual spectacle of yourself before men. Jesus says, that's how my disciples pray. And he goes on. And we'll skip over verses 7 and 8. We'll get to this passage within the year. I'm very excited about that. But Jesus says in chapter 6, verse 9, pray then in this way. He says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Stop there for just a moment. Notice that Jesus says, when you pray, start out by exalting God and exalting His name, praising Him for who He is. Come to God with a spirit of submission that says, not my will, but thine be done. 
And a spirit that says, oh God, your kingdom come. Lord, let this earth pass away. God, I pray for the coming of your kingdom. I pray for your will to be done. I praise and worship and exalt you. And you come in a spirit of dependence that says, give us this day our daily bread. Oh God, sustain our daily existence. And in that spirit of private devotion of prayer, notice what Jesus says that the nature of prayer, obviously in sincerity, should be. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Look at verse 14. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Wow. Jesus says, understand that when you come to God in prayer, that you must come with a forgiving disposition as one of His disciples, that you cannot be in God's presence with a bitter, angry spirit, hostile toward men. No, Jesus says, that's not the nature of God. That's not the nature of salvation. That's not the nature of life in the kingdom. Jesus says, no, if you want to pray to God and have full access, unhindered access to Him, you check your heart and see if you've been forgiving, if you have a forgiving disposition toward those that have wronged you. Jesus says, if you have, then ask God to forgive your sins. Ask Him to forgive your debts. But if you have in your heart, I will not forgive, I will, be, I will be firm and I am bitter and I don't care, Jesus says, don't waste your time or God's, because if you're praying like that, your Father won't forgive your transgressions. It's very searching, actually, to realize that Jesus Christ links your forgiveness of sin with a willingness to have a forgiving disposition toward others. And so this sobers us. It's not that we forgive other people's sins so that we deserve forgiveness from God. That's not the point. Jesus is simply saying that the nature of life in the kingdom of God is that you've been granted admission into His kingdom through a gracious act of forgiveness from God. And if you have been forgiven much, then you should be willing to forgive much as well, and that that is the spirit in which you come to God. And so... And so, in one sense, say, God, forgive me of my sins while harboring in our own hearts and minds. I refuse to forgive that person. I'm angry, and I don't care. Those two things don't go together. And there's a reason why. This is why your prayer life shrivels up when you have a hard and resentful attitude towards someone else. It's because prayer doesn't work in that environment. It's stepping on the air hose of communion with God. Hard and irreconcilable hearts have no place in the body of Christ. Now, with all of that in mind, that will help frame things as we go to the book of Philemon and finish our study here today. So turn back to Philemon here with that sense of forgiveness laid out for us in from the text and words of Jesus. Today, God has given us, and in the book of Philemon, God has given us a word that gives us a real-life illustration of the principle of forgiveness from Paul's letter to Philemon. It's a real-life illustration that lets us see, without direct didactic teaching, illustrates for us a way and a principle that helps us see this is how forgiveness plays out in the life of the church. It's a very sweet and precious letter for that reason. For those of you that have been with us by now, you know the story, and I'm not going to rehearse it in detail. Here in the book of Philemon, what has happened is this. Paul has sent a fugitive slave back to his master, a slave that has wronged his master, probably stolen from him, and disgraced his master and harmed him in many ways. Philemon is the slave owner. Onesimus is the slave in this picture. And Onesimus makes his way to Rome and somehow connects up with the Apostle Paul. And under the influence of the Apostle Paul, he comes to saving faith in Christ. 
begins to serve Paul, and they develop a close and, and loving friendship as Onesimus serves him well. But now it's time for Onesimus to make restitution to his master. He needs to make things right, especially because it's in his capacity to do so. And so Paul writes a letter to his former master, Philemon, who is a wealthy and godly Christian man. Paul writes a letter to Philemon, a letter of reintroduction of Onesimus, and says, Philemon, I'm asking you to forgive your former slave and receive him back without holding it against him. That brings us here to the point of the story. Paul now in the text, as we pick up the text in verse 17, Paul is about to make the request, which is the point of the entire letter. It's quite interesting, and it's in keeping with the, the nature of the style of the Apostle Paul, that he has said many, many things in order to build up to the real point that he wants to make. 16 verses now in our English text, 16 verses have been leading up to verse 17. And we won't, re we won't rehearse everything prior to that. I'm just going to assume that you've been with us, and if perhaps you've missed it, you can pick them up from downloads at our website. In verse 17, Paul says to Philemon, "'If then you, Philemon, regard me, Paul, a partner, Accept him, Onesimus, as you would me. Paul has explained Onesimus' conversion. He's, he's explained how he loves this man and how Onesimus is coming back and has a spirit to want to make things right. I know he was a fugitive. I know he ran away. But, oh, Philemon, if you only knew how much the grace of God has changed him and transformed him. He's a totally new man, Philemon. And so I'm asking you as a friend to receive him just like you would me, to accept him as you would me. It's a, it's a powerful request. Accept him has the idea of welcome him. Treat him with hospitality. Receive him with kindness. That's what he says when he says, accept him. What he's saying is this. He says, Philemon, don't hold his prior offense against him. Don't hold that against him. Receive this fugitive slave in the same way that you would receive me myself. How would Philemon receive Paul if he showed up? The great apostle, if he had showed up instead of Onesimus, you know, with the, the rust from the chain still dripping from his wrists. And all of a sudden, Philemon opens the door, and there's Paul. What would he do? Paul! Oh! And throw his arms around him and bring him in and hold him close. And Paul, come in, and whatever you need, I'm going to take care of you. I'm so glad you're back, brother, kissing him on the cheek and hugging his neck. Oh, Paul, I've missed you. Oh, Paul, how are you? Oh, Paul, let's share together. Paul knew that that's how Philemon would receive him if Paul showed up. Paul says, Philemon, I want you to receive Onesimus just like that. In terms of what Paul has expressed about the relationship, what has Paul said about how he regards Philemon here? Look at verse 1 of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. Paul says, Philemon, you know what you are to me? You're a beloved brother. You're a fellow worker in Christ. We are partners together for Christ. And I'm so glad to know you. Look at verse 7. He says, I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. And here in verse 17, he says, if you regard me as a partner. And so just in this short little span of space, Paul has said, Philemon, you're my brother. I love you. Philemon, you're a fellow worker. You're a partner in the gospel. We are, we are joined together at the hip. 
We are, we are united and, and, and there is no way that I can fully express the appreciation that I have for you and I know you feel that way about me also. That's the nature of the relationship that they had. And so when you view it from that perspective, you see what a daring statement, how bold, how far-reaching it is for Paul from prison through a letter to say to Philemon, Philemon, I want you to receive Onesimus just like that. No hesitation, no qualification, receive him like you would me. Philemon, receive him like you would me, even more, Philemon, I ask you to receive him, watch this, I ask you to receive him as a spiritual equal in Christ because he has been converted. He bears the fruit of genuine salvation. He is a beloved brother to me. Philemon, I ask you to receive him just like that, just like you would me. And so, notice, listen, remember that Philemon has genuinely been wronged by this man that's in front of him. Genuine theft, genuine economic loss. Perhaps, we don't know at all, this is pure, utter speculation, perhaps there's a sense of personal injury that he felt as well, that this was an insult as well. Perhaps he had to go and and purchase other men to replace the lost work that from Onesimus. Great loss in the midst. And in that context of, of, of loss and sin and injury by the man standing in front of him, Paul says, Philemon, receive him like you would me. This is something that is transhuman. By which I mean this transcends human motives. This goes beyond human expectation. This brings us into the realm of the power of the gospel of Christ to view men differently because of the work of Christ in their hearts. To no longer view them according to their past sins, to no longer hold those things against them, even when it's been a personal loss, to say, yes, I receive you and I welcome you. It's the nature of forgiveness in the body of Christ when you are dealing with true believers who are truly repentant. There's no reason not to receive them. Now, let's follow along here. There's something else to be said, and Paul is very mindful of it. The fact of the matter is, is that there was a debt of some kind. There was an injury that had been made, and Onesimus is a fugitive slave probably had squandered whatever he had stolen, he had no means to pay it back. And so the Apostle Paul recognizes that he's asking Philemon to do something while there is an existing debt still on Onesimus' account. And Paul, in his grace, in an illustration of the gospel of Christ, removes that impediment to reconciliation as well. Look at verse 18. He says, but if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. What's Paul doing here? He's saying, Philemon, I realize that there's a matter of unsatisfied restitution here. Whatever it is, whatever it may be, I realize that that's a problem. And Philemon, I'm not asking you to bear that loss personally. He gives him a handwritten guarantee that Paul himself will fully make restitution on behalf of Onesimus. He guarantees the debt. From his own personal resources, Paul bears the loss. Paul says, I'll bear the loss so that there's absolutely no barrier between you and Onesimus. I want you to feel free to receive him freely. Paul covers the debt personally from his own resources. Jesus asks us to approach conflict with the spirit of forgiveness, and He has equipped us to be able to do so. May your heart be in accord with the Lord's 
every day of your life. Well, next time on The Truth Pulpit, Pastor Don Green will wrap up our series in Philemon titled Charge That to My Account. So be sure to join us then. Right now, though, Don's back here in studio, and he has some closing thoughts. Hi, friend. Let me give you just a closing word of encouragement as we wrap up today's broadcast. I know that many of you have found us for the first time on Christian radio, and that's wonderful. But I also realize that sometimes your schedules don't let you work around the broadcast schedule. We have made it possible for you to be able to still get the Truth Pulpit on a regular basis. We have a broadcast of each radio broadcast that uh, you can find, and you can have it automatically delivered to your favorite listening device. If you go to our website, you can find a link to the podcast, sign up for it, and be sure to catch every episode. Here's Bill to help you find it. Just visit thetruthpulpit.com where you can also learn more about this ministry. Once again, that's thetruthpulpit.com. Now for Don Green, I'm Bill Wright, inviting you back next time when Don presents more from The Truth Pulpit.